Our text today is from the book of Romans, chapter 9, from verse 6 to 18. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had, done nothing, and had nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, so that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Let us pray. Lord, as we contemplate this challenging doctrine this morning, we pray first of all that you would be glorified, that you would teach us your word, that you would stir our hearts to know the truth of the scriptures, and that you draw close to us by your spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The doctrine of unconditional election, the Reformed doctrine, is one of the most profound and sometimes controversial teachings in Christian theology. This doctrine emphasizes the sovereignty of God in the salvation of humanity. It teaches that God, in His infinite wisdom and grace, chose certain individuals for salvation before the foundation of the world not based on any foreseen merit or action on their part, but solely according to his divine will and pleasure. And to understand unconditional election, we first need to see the clear connection that it has with the doctrine of total depravity, which we looked at last week. Every aspect of human nature is tainted by sin, meaning that we are utterly incapable of coming to God through our own efforts or merit. This desperate situation necessitates a radical intervention by God. And it's an intervention which the doctrine of unconditional election explains. Unconditional election is often misunderstood to mean that God's predestination of people is based on his foreknowledge of their faith and obedience. In other words, God knows who will receive him rather than reject him, so those are the ones he elects to save. But this is conditional election, which is something the Bible does not teach. The, the reformed Calvinistic view taken from Scripture is, is that God's choice does not depend on human actions. Instead, it is an expression of his sovereign grace. And we'll look at several texts which back up this teaching. God's selection of the elect is ground in his eternal purposes and love, rather than any human characteristic or decision. And the implications of unconditional election are many. For Christians, this doctrine gives tremendous assurance and comfort, because we know that our salvation depends on the unchangeable will of God, rather than our fluctuating faith or our works which are tainted by our sin. Unconditional election underlines the sheer grace of God, which is the result of his absolute sovereignty. And that's something we looked at at the beginning of the series. God is the ultimate authority over all of creation, and his purposes cannot be thwarted. Yet, the doctrine of unconditional election is not without its challenges and its criticisms. Questions about divine justice and human free will are often raised. Critics argue that this doctrine portrays God as arbitrary or even unjust, 
so we do need to look at some of those objections. The short answer is what God says to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But we will go into the objections to unconditional election in more detail in a moment. The bigger picture is that this doctrine magnifies the glory and the grace of God. It calls us to trust in his mysterious yet perfect will because it reveals to us a God who is both sovereign and loving. A God who chooses to save not because of who we are but because of who he is. And this understanding will transform our faith and it leads us to a worship which is grounded in awe and reverence for this God who elects unconditionally. So what do we mean when we use this term, unconditional election? It doesn't mean that God will save people no matter whether they come to faith or not. There are conditions that God has for salvation, not least of which is putting one's personal trust in Jesus Christ. So on what basis does God elect to save certain people? Is it on the basis of some foreseen reaction, response or activity of the elect? Many people's understanding of unconditional election is something like this. From all of eternity, God looks through the corridors of time and he knows in advance who will say yes to the offer of the gospel and who will say no. So on the basis of this prior knowledge, those whom he knows will meet this condition for salvation, those who express faith in Christ, he then elects those people to save. But again, that is conditional election. That, that is a belief based on some foreseen condition that human beings exercise themselves. Every Christian has to believe in some kind of election. The concept appears too frequently in the Bible to deny it. It's there. However, some who have trouble with the doctrine of unconditional election accept it in part, but they reduce it from what it really is by arguing for what is called conditional election. This means that God bases his election of an individual on foresight, foreseeing whether that particular person will have faith or not. But there's a problem with this view, because it destroys the very meaning of the word election. Conditional election is not really election at all. It actually means that men and women are then able to elect themselves and God is reduced to a bystander who responds to their free choice. And this completely undermines the sovereignty of God. Also, if election is based on what God foresees an individual might do, what does that do to the doctrine of total depravity? The Bible is clear on this doctrine. Remember that in Ephesians 2 verse 1, Paul says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. So how can God possibly foresee a spiritually dead sinner do anything other than reject the gospel? Because that then becomes the only option if you, if you, follow, if you follow the logic. The very definition of conditional election is that we play a part in our election. The logical conclusion of which is that nobody would be saved. Because the Bible repeatedly teaches that because of our total depravity, no one will choose God. John Calvin explained it like this. What could God foresee but this corrupted mass of Adam that brings forth no other fruit but malediction? Take away election and what shall remain? As we have declared, we remain altogether lost and accursed. To assume that faith to choose Christ is something we already have within us denies the biblical doctrine of total depravity. And the verse which is most often used to support conditional election is Romans 8 verse 29, which says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son.'" 
However, the word foreknew in this verse is not about God's foresight. It's not about his ability to predict the future. Instead, the word foreknew in Romans 8.29 indicates God's choice. The text does not say that God foreknew what certain individuals would do. Only that he foreknew them as individuals to whom he would extend the grace of salvation. John MacArthur explains it like this in his commentary. For new is not a reference simply to God's omniscience, that in eternity past he knew who would come to Christ, although he certainly does know that. Rather, it speaks of a predetermined choice to set his love on us and establish an intimate relationship or his election. Unconditional election means exactly what it says, that God elects with no conditions. There is no foreseen action or condition that we meet which causes God to decide to save us. It rests upon his sovereign decision to save whomsoever he is pleased to save. We've only just begun this series on the doctrines of sovereign grace, but as we move forward, we'll see how the five points of Calvinism are all interrelated. Throughout the Bible, there are countless passages that deal with election. But the most extensive biblical treatment of this difficult subject is Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 9, where he reaches back into the Old Testament and the account of Jacob and Esau. In the ancient world, it was customary for the firstborn son to receive the inheritance, all of it. The, the patriarchal blessing was his. But in the case of these twin brothers, God reversed the process because Esau was born before Jacob. He reversed the process and he gave the blessing not to the elder, but to the younger. And Paul stresses the point that this decision was not with a view to anything that they had done or would do. The decision was, not made, was made before their birth. And also, it was not made with a view to their doing any good or evil in, in the future. And Paul uses this illustration to show that the will of God is sovereign. It does not depend on us, but solely on the gracious, sovereign decision of God. And in this case, God's sovereign choice of Jacob was made before either child had an opportunity to do either good or evil. The choice was made while those children were still in the womb. And this means, and this is the important part, that election cannot be on the basis of anything done by us. In fact, Paul teaches that the choice of Jacob rather than Esau was made specifically to teach the doctrine of election. In verse 11, he writes, Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. God made his choice before the birth of Rebekah's sons to show that his election is apart from anything a human being might or might not do. In verse 18, Paul says, He has mercy on, whom, on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And then going back to verse 14, Paul deals with the inevitable question which is asked about the biblical doctrine of unconditional election. Is this fair? And he writes, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. That's the English Standard Version. New King James Version says, is there, any, is, is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. What we need to remember is that nobody deserves salvation in the first place. If God were to let the entire human race perish, he would be perfectly just in doing so. The only way that anyone could ever be saved at all is by the grace of God. And in Romans 9, Paul anticipates the objections to election or predestination. So how does he respond to those questions? By teaching that God's election is unconditional. And there are many other passages of scripture which teach unconditional election. And we'll take a brief look at just a few of them. Firstly, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. 
It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your, forefa- to your fathers. That the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is addressed to the nation of Israel. God did not choose them because they were numerous or inherently deserving. God's choice was rooted in his love and his faithfulness to his promises. This highlights that the basis for God's election is his own sovereign will and love, and nothing external to that or conditional. And the reference in verse 8 to God bringing Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand reminds us of his sovereign action in redeeming people. Then John 15 verse 16, the words of Jesus You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. The disciples' relationship with Jesus was initiated by Jesus himself, not by the disciples. And in this verse, he explains the purpose of him choosing them. Jesus appointed them to bear fruit, which means that God's election is not arbitrary, but it's directed towards a specific end. The disciples were appointed to fulfill his purposes, including bearing spiritual fruit and advancing his kingdom. Then in Acts chapter uh, chapter 13, from verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. That phrase at the end there, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, that shows us that there is a specific group of people who were destined or preordained by God to receive eternal life. Their faith was a direct consequence of God's prior appointment. So faith is not a condition for election. Faith is not a condition for election. Rather, it is the result of being elected by God. God's sovereign choice precedes and enables belief. And then Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. We had this up last week as well. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. God's choice of individuals for salvation was made before the foundation of the world, based solely on His sovereign will and love and not on any foreseen actions or merits of those whom he has chosen. God's election is an unconditional act of his grace and sovereign purpose. And Paul writes that as a result of our election, we are then made holy and blameless before him. MacArthur again writes, This describes both a purpose and a result of God's choosing those who are to be saved. Unrighteous persons are declared righteous. Unworthy sinners are declared worthy of salvation, all because they are chosen in him. This then leads us to another difficult subject, but it's one that we can't avoid. And that is what is known as the doctrine of reprobation. The teaching that God rejects or repudiates some people to eternal condemnation in a way which is parallel to but opposite to his ordaining those to to salvation. The reason we can't avoid it is because it is in the Bible. And Paul, in his teaching in Romans 9, quotes two Old Testament passages. Firstly, Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And then he quotes from Exodus 9, 16, where God says to Pharaoh, For this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. And then again in Romans 9, 18, 
He has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Just as with the doctrine of unconditional election, the Bible also teaches the doctrine of reprobation. But before we take a closer look at this difficult subject, we need to see that the Bible does in fact teach it. Proverbs 6, 16, Proverbs 16 verse 4. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. The words of Jesus, John 13 verse 18. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And 1 Peter 2 verses 7 and 8. The honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And also, the Westminster Confession of Faith speaks about these two doctrines of unconditional election and reprobation. Firstly, in chapter 3, verse 5, those of mankind that are predestinated unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of his free grace and love alone, without any foresight of faith or good works, or perseverance in either of them. And then in section 7 is the doctrine of reprobation. The rest of mankind, God was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth, for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures to pass by, and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin, to the praise of his glorious justice. Now, these two statements teach that in some ways, Election and reprobation are the same in that they are the result of the eternal counsel or will of God rather than the will of man. And both have as their ultimate purpose the revelation of God's glory. But there are two important differences here which will help us to understand this doctrine of reprobation. Firstly, the confession speaks of the reprobate being passed by. The reason why some believe the gospel and are saved is because God intervenes in their lives to bring them to faith. He does this through the new birth or regeneration. But those who are lost, and this is important, they are not caused by God to disbelieve. They do that all by themselves because of their natural rebellion against God. And secondly, the confession speaks of God ordaining the lost to dishonor and wrath for their sin. And this deals with the argument that unconditional election is unfair. Because the, condition, the, the doctrine of reprobation is the exact opposite of an arbitrary action. The lost are not sent to hell because God sends them there arbitrarily or on nothing more than a whim. They are sent there as a judgment for their sins. That's the justice of God. Abraham Kuyper he said, we dare not forget that while God, according to the secret of his counsel, elects those who are to be saved, the same omnipotent God has made us morally responsible so that we are lost, not because we could not be saved, but because we would not. These two doctrines of unconditional election and reprobation are not easy, yet they are clearly taught in the Bible. And the Westminster Confession of Faith quite correctly teaches that both of these doctrines reveal the glory of God. Part of the reason is, is that they, these two doctrines put us in our proper place as fallen human beings. The very nature of sin is wanting to be in God's place. But as long as we want to be God, we will never humble ourselves in submission to His sovereign will. Instead, we want to argue with God. And that's a very bad place to be. The correct starting point is to confess that God is God and He can do whatever He pleases, just as the Bible teaches us. He is right and He is just in His actions 
even if we might not understand what he is doing. We don't begin our debates and our arguments with Almighty God from any position of strength, because we have none. But this is how so many people, including many Christians, react whenever they feel that God has some explaining to do. And we would do well to heed Paul's words as he concludes his teaching on, uncon on unconditional election in Romans chapter 9. Picking it up from verse 18 again. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not only from the Jews, not only from the Jews, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. So how are we to understand God's justice? We start with the fact that God is just, as well as with the fact that he elects some to salvation and he passes by others. Again, he is sovereign. All human beings deserve hell, not heaven. The important word here is deserve. What we all deserve is condemnation. That is justice. The justice of God, if it were carried out apart from his mercy, would send every human being to hell. So all we can do is to echo Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 9.15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Were it not for the mercy of God and the atoning death of Jesus Christ on behalf of those who turn to him in faith, we would all be lost. If anyone is to be saved, it must be by mercy only. Deserving has to do with what people have done. Mercy has nothing to do with what people have done. But it is something which finds its source exclusively in the will of God. And as we close, just as last week, we need to look at what we can learn from the doctrine of unconditional election. And how that should impact our lives. And it should come as no surprise that what we, we see the same as how the, the truth of total depravity should affect us. Election is humbling. God has chosen some by grace entirely apart from their own merit or even their ability to receive grace. And that means there is no place for spiritual pride or arrogance among Christians. Also, our election grows our love for God. Because understanding that we've been elected by grace alone undermines our self-centered and our selfish way of living. It should also encourage us in our evangelism. Some say that if God is going to save certain people, then he will save them. So there's no point in our having to do anything about it. But it doesn't work that way. Election does not exclude the use of the means by which God works. And the proclamation of the gospel is one of the primary means. And we're reminded of that in 1 Corinthians 1.21. Since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. We have a role to play as believers. And then finally the big question on all of our minds. Am I one of the elect? The answer to that question is easy. Acts 16, verse 31, says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If you do that, 
you are among the elect. That is the only way that anyone can ever discover who God's elect are. The only infallible proof of election is through belief in Jesus Christ and his saving work on the cross for you. Turn to God and he will grant you repentance and he will grant you the faith to believe. He will save you if you ask him. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your sovereign grace. We thank you that you have chosen to intervene in our fallen and broken world. And if only one person is to be saved, that is all to your glory. We thank you, Lord, for those whom you have called, those to whom, to whom you have granted repentance and faith. Thank you that you removed the scales from eyes and that knees have bowed and tongues have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we pray, Lord, that you'd embolden your church, that we would take that message of hope into the world. Lord, these doctrines confuse us. And many of us, this is, for many of us, this is the first time we've ever heard of something like this. But your word is clear, and we cannot deny what Scripture teaches. And so we pray that you'd help us to submit to your will, to understand that we have no rights. We throw ourselves at your mercy, because that is all that we have. And so we thank you for Christ our Savior. Thank you for the mercy you've shown to us through him and his blood shed on the cross for us. May you be glorified, Lord, because you are sovereign and your will cannot and will not be thwarted. We ask all these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.